Derek. Um, Derek, you spoke here about three three years ago. From yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, tonight, let's hope you'll have some further information in regard yep. to the digitization project that's going on in the, yep. the representative body. Okay, okay. Derek Nielsen. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Uh, yes, uh, it was whatever it was, three years ago that I was here. Um, and at that stage, I was talking about some of the quirks in the Church of Ireland records. This time, I'm going to be covering the digitization of the records. Some of the slides, if you can remember back three years ago, some of the slides will be the same. Because what I want to go into is the fact that in the Church of Ireland, you're not just talking about the registers, there's a lot more information that is available um, than you might think. Now, last time I used an example of St. Paul's Parish, which is in, uh, uh, north, uh, uh, north of the River Liffey, uh, which is no more. Uh, this time I'm actually going to use um, uh, a parish on the south side, St. Catharines on Thomas Street. Um, partly because of a couple of cases I've been involved in over the past few years um, and I found some of the records in there actually very interesting and very helpful in trying to trace people um, and I'll also allude to one or two other parishes as well um, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in again and say what records exist um, where they're located, and they're really in, I suppose you could say, three main places, and one which is the parishes. Um, the effect of the destruction of them in the PRO uh, in 1922, it did have a more of a psychological effect than anything else. What the records show, and um, other non-Church of Ireland records, and obviously the thing that a lot of people are looking forward to now, which is the digitization. Uh, from the uh, from the, the various uh, depositories. Now, um, the Church of Ireland is a member of the Anglican Communion. Okay, so often if you if you look at uh, the 1901 1911 census, you'll sometimes see Church of Ireland or Presbyterian or Roman Catholic. Sometimes you'll see uh, Irish Church or State Church. <coughs> and that effectively people are still considering, despite the fact that you're talking uh, you know, 30 to 40 years after uh, the end of uh, the established church uh, and disestablishment in, in, in uh, 1870, 1871, you're still, people are still talk, thinking about it as state church. Um, so similar churches, and this is where, like if, you're, if, if people are talking to you and they're from overseas, is similar to the Church of England, is similar to the Anglican Church of Australia and the Episcopal Church in America, but it is not the same as the Church of Scotland. I can talk about that because I'm Scottish, so I know about it. The Church of Scotland is effectively a Presbyterian church. The Episcopal Church of Scotland is the Anglican Church. So just to confuse issues. Uh, so sometimes, <coughs> sometimes people get slightly confused uh, if they're dealing with Scottish and Irish records, which a lot of people can do, uh, especially with people being planted over uh, in the plantation of Ulster. Uh, so the Church of Ireland was set up in 1534 and the parishes have virtually mirrored the civil parishes. So the Catholic parishes would be slightly different but the civil parishes and the Church of Ireland parishes would largely be the same. And the earliest Church of Ireland registers are for St John the Evangelist in Dublin which started in 1619. That was around Fishambo Street. So again, no longer there. So the, the parishes became an arm of the state. And this is where we get into a problem later on with the Public Records Office, because the Church of Ireland saw itself as doing everything as it, as it was asked to do. The Catholic Church didn't. Okay, so the Church of Ireland deposited everything as they were requested to do, and consequently a lot of stuff got burned. Um, there was a requirement for parishes to keep registers from about 1634. 
And it was a state church until the 1st of January 1871, which is the date of disestablishment. Um, and registers prior to that date were, had been declared public records and were in the public records office. And that is why uh, there was such a loss in 1922 of those, along with all of the other records, such as the wills and uh, the earlier censuses. So this establishment, um, after 1871, because it was no longer a state church, the records were seen as private records. Um, but that then caused a problem because they had to be renationalized in 1875 because they were actually a record of events. Okay, they were a definitive record of events. And this, this comes up for the sake of argument in 1908 with the, uh, with the uh, first social or first state pension um, where people were looking back to the 1851 uh, census or they were looking back to registers be they Catholic registers or Church of Ireland registers um, so the uh, edict was that the register should be put into the public records office which was at that stage obviously declared safe or to be put into fireproof safe to keep them safe now one of the things and about the records in to a certain extent, I'll come on to it slightly later. These records were um, were loose leafed, so they were completed on a sheet of paper, um, and then when you had enough, they were sent to a bookbinder, and they were bound into books. Okay, this certainly caused a problem for me in one particular case, and I'll come on to that hopefully later on. So, 1922 and the destruction of the public records office. So, records for just over a thousand parishes and other institutions such as uh, societies, etc., and a lot of societies attached to the Church of Ireland were destroyed. Um, some of these have been copied, but um, entries are a bit selective. For the sake of argument, St. Hans and Dawson Street, early registers there were destroyed and someone contacted me earlier this year and was looking to locate the marriage of uh, two ancestors and I said well unfortunately the, the registers have been destroyed but there is uh, something in the National Library in the manuscripts area which says that they have uh, uh, registers of marriages for four Dublin parishes, St. Mickens, uh, I forget whether the, the uh, St. Mickens, I think St. possibly St. Andrews, uh, St. Anne's, and one other central Dublin church. Uh, and I said, I'll go and check. But when I actually went to check, it was very selective. It was basically, it was a copy book. And presumably it was someone who'd been doing work at some stage, maybe on a particular family or a, a a couple of different families and had taken down the selective <coughs> marriages and I think some, there were some births and deaths in there as well so it was very very little it was it didn't comprise of anything and in fact it was useless for my purpose uh, although I did find something for for the individuals later on um, but unfortunately those records were actually lost um, but over 600 parishes had were still holding their registers locally because some of these registers go on for some time. My own parish, uh, which is in Wicklow Calvary <coughs> Parish, um, the earlier records between when the church or the parish was set up in 1831 and 1875, they were destroyed. So that's the births, deaths, and marriages were all destroyed. But from 1875 on, uh, the registers are still in existence. Um, and in fact, uh, they're all still being used because they're large books, uh, and there wouldn't be that many people, probably. So the registers are still being used, <coughs> so they weren't, they weren't actually in the public records office, whereas the earlier ones were. Um, I mentioned the psychological event uh, effect of the public fire in the public records office. That has led to a number of parishes, um, allegedly, and this is just, this is just hearsay, talking to some people, especially down the country, saying that they did not want to put their registers into the uh, 
RCB library, which I'll come on to, to, to later on as one of the repositories, because they didn't trust them being in one place and that place going on fire. So and I think that's still, that's still the effect is still there. Uh, so that's why in some cases the registers are still in the parishes. I'm going to come on now to how the Ch Church of Ireland Parish actually works. In January each year, there's a, a register of people who are members of the parish and also people who have an association to the parish. And that register is supposed to be updated every January. Okay? Because at Easter every year, the two weeks prior to Easter, two weeks after Easter, there's meant to be what's called the General Easter Vestry. The General Easter Vestry is, is, I always actually think of Church of Ireland parishes like companies. And you're like a, a private limited company. So your, your registry of vestry, or vestry men or vestry persons is um, basically your shareholders. Um, and then when it comes to the General Easter Vestry, the chairman, the rector, whoever it is, gets up and you know, says what's happened in the parish, the, the treasurer gives an account of the you know, profit and loss in the parish for the last year, um, and then people are elected, and those people are elected onto what's called a select vestry. A select vestry meets <coughs> as and when required, sometimes it can be on a monthly basis, sometimes a quarterly basis, depending on the amount of work that's required, and they basically run the parish for the year. Okay, so that's like a board of directors. And they will run the parish and they'll decide, yes, we need to get the tower redone or we need to get this done or we're going to do whatever. Um, so they are, they are basically the people who are elected for a year. And then the following year, they can go on for re-election. Some people go on and they're probably on the select vestry for maybe 60 years. You know? um, they probably actually take them out in the coffin. So, um, so that's I mean, I mean that, that that's quite frequent. You will see some have been parish secretary for forty years. Like you know, it's a bit, bit long. However, some people like it. Um, now the parishes themselves, um, they normally would have started off as um, single church parishes. So in our own case, the parish started in eighteen thirty one and remained a single parish until nineteen forty one. It's in the middle of basically it's in the middle of nowhere. And you would say, if, if anyone knows calories, it's between Kilmacanagan and Renwood. It's up in the mountains. Okay? Um, and you'd say, why do you put a church there? Well, in the 1830s, there were about 3,000 people living in the Calry area. It's, uh, you couldn't believe it, looking at the place now. But there were about 3,000 3, people living there. So it was, you know, a church was set up there for the people who were living there, and also basically to evangelise the area, because it was the state church. Um, so this is why sometimes you'll see a Church of Ireland Parish in the middle of nowhere. It was set up certainly pre-famine times um, and uh, it was set up there and it was to get to cover an area of, of, uh, of the country uh, and now the place is denuded of people and denuded of parishioners. Um, obviously with the changes that happened in the first 20, 30 years of the last century with uh, uh, the Irish state being set up with the First World War, with even things like the Boer War, with uh, rentals for people who owned large tracts of land reducing uh, and making it uneconomic, the number of people within the Church of Ireland reduced. And that would be especially after the First World War and you know, after the, 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 the set up, setting up of, of the Irish state. So by 1906, you're talking about less than 100,000 people. And that meant that unfortunately some churches had to close. Now you wouldn't believe the arguments that people put up with to stop a church being closed. Uh, but I've, I've heard it's, it's actually nearly destroyed some rectors at times, psychologically, because they got people against them and fighting them all the time. You're there to, to preach to people and to help them and all this, 
and all you're getting is a grief bank. So sometimes what you'll see in uh, Church of Ireland parishes is you'll see six or even in the west of Ireland maybe eight churches in one parish. Okay? And they're serviced by one rector and possibly by some what are called lay readers. Um, or uh, diocesan readers or parish readers. Uh, so I had a friend who went down to Mount Rath, which is called Clonena. This is, this is another slight oddity as well, the, the change of names. Um, and he had six churches to look after. So in theory, every Sunday, he might have six services to conduct. But he didn't actually conduct six services. He might do one on a Saturday night, and he might do two on a Sunday, and then parish readers might do others. Or some of the churches might not have a service every single Sunday. Okay. So that, that's uh, quite a, a reasonably common thing. Uh, I mentioned just the fact that Clonena and Mandrath, a friend of mine actually is, is, is rector down in Dunmanway. It's not called Dunmanway, it's called Fanlobus. Um, slight oddity, and calorie is sometimes attributed to Kilmechanic. Technically speaking, it's not. But it, no. so, so sometimes you can have a problem with, with the name and the, because of the location of the church, because it's maybe not in where you expect it to be. <coughs> So you had the merging of parishes, and this, this happened as well in Dublin. Uh, so uh, in Dublin, in the inner city, you have one parish covering the south of the city and one the north. But you have certain odd churches in there as well, like St. Catherine's, which I'll come on to, which is not effectively a parish church. It's, it's there set up as a, a, a church of fresh expressions. Okay, you sometimes have trustee churches, that's like oddities. Chapels of Ease, we have a chapel of Ease uh, in, the, in the next parish to us. Okay. Uh, but, uh, so, but you have what are sometimes termed grouped parishes and united parishes. This, um, my, own, the, my own parish is the parish of Newcastle and Newtown Mount Kendy with Calvary. Now, that actually means Newcastle and Newtown Mount Kendy are one vestry. Okay, so we were talking about the general Easter vestry before the select vestry. They're run by one committee. Calory is a grouped parish and is run by a separate committee. Okay, separate select vestry. Okay. Do you want me to go over that again? Or are you happy? <laughs> I know it's confusing. It, it, to, to, it, it, it doesn't... Sometimes you can be... We, we, at one stage we were united. We were united with another parish. And then we were taken out. Because things are fluid sometimes, because for the sake of our, the church that we were united with was Derlossary, which is where President Childers is buried, and is on the far side of Renwood. But then they decided to close that church, and that parish then was split between two other parishes. So it's fluid, and that's still happening. There are still churches occasionally being closed, not as frequently as had happened, because the numbers have bottomed out, and if anything, are increasing slightly. But still, at times, you have churches which have maybe only 20 people going in on a, on a Sunday, whereas others will have maybe 100. Okay. And some of, the, some of the inner city churches will have maybe even slightly more. So the effect that that can have is that because a church is maybe in one parish now, but it was in another parish at one stage, might mean that if you're having to look for people a family, you might actually have to look in two parishes, okay, to be absolutely sure that you're covering everything. Um, and there is also an issue with the grave, graveyards, or graveyard, technically speaking, is is a graveyard on its own. A uh, graveyard beside a, a church is normally termed a churchyard. Again, confusion. Okay. Um, but. Uh, we still have what are called pre-disestablishment graveyards. A pre-disestablishment graveyard, Calvary has a pre-disestablishment graveyard because the graveyard started before the Irish Church Act, before disestablishment. That means that anyone in the parish who wants to be buried in the churchyard, whatever religion they are, can be buried there. And I think, in fact, when I was here the last time, I mentioned uh, I mentioned the fact that we have Catholics buried there, obviously Church of Ireland people, Presbyterians, Methodists, and I think I mentioned 
Jewish people who were buried there. And Stuart had actually asked me, because two of the people who were actually buried in the graveyard, there were four Jewish people buried in the graveyard, or two certainly who were, they, I think they were in Bergen-Belsen, uh, they were children, uh, I'm not sure whether they, technically speaking, were still Jewish, but there was a couple of Jewish people, and the Star of David was on their grave, okay, and he hadn't known about these two people. I didn't know about them either. A lot of the people come in from, from outside the parish, were, were buried uh, from outside the parish. These people were buried in the 1960s. So pre-disestablishing graveyards can include anyone in the parish, okay, uh, of whatever religion. Um, so uh, what you'll tend to find is that especially for a lot of Church of Ireland parishes in the Dublin area, a lot of their graveyards are now full. Uh, ours isn't. I'll do an ad for it if you like, I don't mind. I don't have the prices here, but... Um, but <coughs> a lot of even even graveyards for parishes relatively close to us, like Newcastle Parish, I think, is only for people uh, in existing graves. I think uh, that's that type of thing. Uh, but we again we have a, the previous establishment graveyard, but beside that we have what's called the church field, which was given to us for more burials. I was in hope of having loads of burials, mm. um, um, but we haven't had that many yet. So the, the graveyard will. We'll keep going for a while. This establishment. So, as I said, the purpose of this um, talk really is, is to is to concentrate on the fact that we have more than just registers. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of other things, and I mean, I have the list there of the stuff for St. Catherine's, and uh, I'll go into that in, in a minute. And as I say, some of the old registers are still in use. So there are, there are probably four places, as I said, to see the, the records. One is in the parish. One is in Prony, in Northern Ireland. And I'll come on to the, the records in the separate, three, three separate places uh, shortly, individually. Another place is the National Archives, the Public Records Office of Ireland, PROI. And the, the main uh, repository for them is the Representative Church Body Library. Do you has anyone ever been in there? You have, right? Okay, so you've been in and you've you've seen the. Uh, have you actually been been checking records in there? Yeah. You have, yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, you have registers which are that size, and you have registers which are that size. Uh, so uh, other areas, obviously, are covered on Irish genealogy. So you have Dublin, Carlo, and um, Kerry. Uh, um, church records, you find my path for some of the more specialised things that Bishop <coughs> Sings, uh, Edward Sings, um, Census of Elf in. Um, and one of the things over the past number of years is that the Rev Centre Church body has been pushing parishes to um, put the records in, either in the library or into the National Archives, or into Prony, to actually put them into somewhere, because there's as much uh, chance of um, registers being lost in a parish as there is if, there, if they were in, in uh, Reps in Church Body Library. In our own parish a number of years ago, we had a safe, I don't know how old it was, it was a huge, big thing, it was broken into, the back was taken off it. And if the register had been in there, it would probably have been left in there. I mean, they were obviously looking for, for valuables. But it could have, I mean, they could have decided to, to try and set things on papers on fire or whatever. So it could just as easily have been lost there as anywhere else. Luckily, nothing happened. So how to identify the parish? Now, I have this little book here, Church of Ireland Directory. And uh, if you're ever in the National Library, they have a copy. It's, it's not an up-to-date copy, but it's, it's reasonably okay. But that has a list of parishes in here. Um, the list of parishes there. And it links back to the existing parish that that church is part of now, and the diocese. So if you ever have a problem for the sake of argument, locating Callery Parish, you'll see it's on the Newcastle, and it's in the Diocese of Glendalough. Okay, so 
you can go back and you can see, well, that, that's fair enough, I know where that is. Okay. This also shows, <clears throat> well, it's, it's pretty well up to date, but it shows also the, whoever's in charge of the parish, and it gives their details there, including normally telephone numbers, mobiles, and um, uh, it gives uh, email addresses as well. So it's quite easy if you want to make contact with someone, that is the book to use, okay? As I say, it's, there's a copy in the National Library. The alternative is to go on to uh, the Church of Ireland website and then go on through the diocese. Unfortunately, some of the websites, parish websites, aren't necessarily kept up to date. Uh, that is probably within, within a, a year, so uh, it should be relatively up to date. If you're looking for the, the actual registers uh, themselves and where they are, uh, the list of Church of Ireland, I see. I assume you've, quite a number of you have seen the PDF that's on yeah, the, of the Church of Ireland uh, registers. I mean, all you have to put, type in the Church of Ireland registers, this comes up. It's absolutely marvellous because it's colour-coded and will show you where, whether they're in Prony, the National Archives, whether they were destroyed, if they're in the RCB Library, whether they're in local custody, it can give comments there sometimes recommending maybe that you go to have a look at Roots. Um, uh, and the other thing is if you actually go into, if you have a, a parish which has a Church of Ireland, it is in the Church of Ireland Library, such as St Catherine's, you can actually click on a link. If you just go up to the, to the parish name, and click on a link and it'll show you exactly what the RCB library holds um, and that's exactly where I got that from I didn't go to the RCB library actually there's, yeah, that's, there's a cover page and then these two pages here are uh, well, actually the four pages so there's five pages in total for this particular parish <coughs> just one cover sheet and then it goes into what they actually hold and I'll go into that in, 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 a, in a few minutes. Um, if you're looking for the list of inner city Dublin parishes, and even it, ha it has some of the ones in the suburbs as well, go on to um, go on to find my past and check out Pettigrew and Alton. I think 1834 is probably the, the first one. Um, how many of you know where St. Nicholas Within is? Vaguely. Yeah. You know vaguely. Right, okay. St. Nicholas Within was a parish in Dublin. Uh, I can't remember when it closed, when it closed probably the 18th something. Um, if, you're in, if you're in Christchurch Cathedral, if you're opposite Christchurch Cathedral, you, you walk along from, um, from Jury's Inn, and you know there's a little peace park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beside that is just an entrance. That's St. Nicholas within. That's all that's left of it. Okay. So that was an inner city Dublin parish. So there was St. Nicholas within. St. Nicholas without was actually part of, was it within St. Patrick's Cathedral. But you have a lot of obviously inner city parishes. A lot of them are closed now. St. Victor's, St. Luke's, uh, St. Andrew's, uh, St. John the Baptist, St. Michael's. But some of them are still in existence. St. Werberg's is still in existence, albeit that it may only have services once a month. Uh, but you can check that depending on what, what particular time you're looking for. So now I'm going to go on to the actual uh, repositories themselves. And Prony, I don't know, have it, has, how many of you have been up to Prony? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right, okay. So they actually hold records for 76 Ulster parishes, um, two of which, one is from County Monaghan and one is from Donegal. Okay. Now, um, we had a, a Tony and I had a, a brief discussion and we were talking about dioceses um, there before, uh, before the, the talk started. Um, there are currently, and I say currently, 12 Church of Ireland dioceses, five in, five in the south, seven in the north. But the, um, the actual parts of those dioceses are probably exactly the same in size. So for the sake of, uh, as, 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 a, um, as Catholic parish, uh, Catholic diocese, so 
you have a diocese of Rafal and you have a, a diocese of Derry. We have a diocese of Derry and Rafal. I would guess that they cover exactly the same areas, but ours is combined, yours isn't. Okay. So, uh, so the diocese uh, for the northern part obviously straddle the border, so you have uh, obviously one parish in Rafal uh, and one parish which is probably in Clocher. And their, uh, their records are in Prony. They shouldn't be there, but they are. Although we have some for the north, but we're not confessing to any. <laughs> um, the registers and the other documents they have are held on microfilm, but <clears throat> they're listed in the e catalogue. But they do have them digitised internally. I didn't actually realise that until I was actually talking to, uh, to someone at the, uh, the General Synod, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, <coughs> And we're talking, and I was saying, what about the digitization of the records up in Prony? And she said, well, the records are digitized in Prony, but they're digitized internally. So, before coming here uh, a week ago, I actually contacted Prony and asked them if there was any, if they had any thoughts about or had any intention to uh, put them online. And the answer to that was no, certainly not in the thoughts of the present time. And I think. When we come on to the RCB library and the digitization there, uh, they wouldn't put them on that website. Uh, so they'd have to put them on their own website somewhere. Or they have to set up their own, own website. So there's no plans there to, to digitize uh, externally. We next come on to the National Archives. And, and they have a, a card index of uh, parishes uh, which they hold on microfilm. Uh, although obviously nowadays you would actually go to the Church of Ireland registers and you'd say, oh, National Archives, right, that's not going to check what there is. The reason some of them are there is that they were behind a firewall in 1922. I think there were, there were actually registers which were being used. And so they weren't actually in the archive at the time. Uh, so they were, they were saved. There's about 111 sets of records for parishes. Uh, some of those include copies. Um, there is a lot of donated and loan material. Actually, when I was in uh, last week, uh, one of the archivists actually gave me a copy of what they have. She had it in a, in a, a folder, so she actually copied the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. Checking some of those, the RCB library has copies of some of them but not copies of all. Um, the parishes are mainly outside Dublin. And I had contacted them, and luckily last night I got, a, got an answer back from one person, and then from the person who's in charge of digitization, she came back this morning to say they have no plans to digitize what they're holding for the Church of Ireland. Obviously because they have other priorities. Uh, within the National Archives. They may put them on at some stage, hopefully they will, uh, but for the time being, if the registers are in, that you're particularly looking for, are in, on microfilm in the National Archives, you're going to have to go in, unfortunately, and, and uh, copy them off yourselves. They are, however, an important resource. Um, certainly, I was checking a couple, uh, uh, some parishes in County Clare for someone uh, and I checked all the ones I could in the RCB library, but there were something like three, I think, or four possibly, which were in the National Archives. So they are, they do actually fill a hole there, and that they are very, very important. These are just some of the, the uh, registers, that, they're not the same ones I had the last time. Uh, so you Castleton Roach uh, from 1728, uh, Carlo from 1698, some of those are, are in, in the RCB library as well. Uh, down Garvin from 1741 inch, uh, down, uh, down there just in the north of Wexford in 1726, McCroom 1727. So you can see that, so th th they could be very useful if you're, if you're looking for particular parishes. We now come on to the RCB library. And the RCB library started in 1932. And it moved to 
where it is now in Churchtown in 1969. It's beside Theological Institute is at the back of it. Okay, so that's where all the, all the students are trained as readers and for ordination. Um, and so they, you'll sometimes see students in there doing work that they use it quite a lot. It's, it has four staff uh, and it's now the main site for the Church of Ireland records. The records are kept to a large extent downstairs, or some records kept downstairs. The bulk, the bulk of the parish registers are kept, all parish registers are kept downstairs. Um, so you probably heard of Susan Hood. She took over from Raymond Rafosse as head of the RCB library. And she has, a, she's absolutely wonderful. She's, she's done, uh, she's a wonderful person to talk to if you have any questions about the Church of Ireland. But having said that, the other staff there, uh, Brian Robert and Mary are, uh, or Jennifer are just as good if you want, if you have a particular question that you want on something, I'm sure they'll be able to answer. <coughs> they have records for now 1,124 parishes. I think when I was over here three years ago, it was just over 1,000, I think maybe 1,009 or something. They've increased, so the, the records that they hold. Not necessarily registers for every parish, uh, but registers for most of them. Uh, 900 and 350 of those predate uh, the statutory requirement for registers, so they go back quite a while. Also, for 21 of the dioceses, 20 of the cathedrals, and other church bound organizations. The, you'll have been familiar when you were up in the RCB library, you would go to a card index and you would look up a particular parish. Or you could look up a person because sometimes you, someone who obviously thinks that their sermons are absolutely wonderful uh, or their children think the sermons were wonderful will send in a collection of daddy's sermons. Okay? So you can go in and you can read them. Okay? What was daddy saying? Mm -hmm. Or great, great, great granddad in 1707 uh, preaching fire and brimstone to everybody. Uh, so those are there. They have architectural plans, they have photographs, they have deeds, they have all sorts of stuff in there. Uh, and it's, it can be very useful to look through. Uh, and there are a lot of societies, I mentioned that, and some of those are actually, uh, I can go on to when we talk about St. Catharines. But we have youth societies, we have men's societies, we have women's societies, all this type of thing. And uh, so all of that is in the card index. Then from the card index, once you find out what particular parish you're looking for, and the Dublin parishes are there under Dublin, and Belfast parishes under Belfast. Then you look up, there's a number, and it's P039 or something, whatever. Uh, and that means that you go to the book for 0 to 55, and you'll check there, and you'll get out that, which is what you're getting off now on the PDF. Okay, it's exactly the same. So they have a lot of, uh, they have all the deeds and the photographs, um, and they have maps as well. We, we actually sent in a map of a graveyard, of the, uh, sorry, the churchyard, which was done in about 1934. Massive thing. It's not quite as wide as that, but that, that type of thing. Um, which, uh, which, we, which was actually, we said, we can't hold it here because we can't even put it in a safe. Like it was a huge thing. So uh, it went into the RCB library, and they have it there. So if anyone was looking for a particular place where someone might be buried, it's, you, you, can say, you can look at the map and you can see where it is. Now, I'm going to go on to some of the other records that we have. Um, I mentioned the vestry and the select vestry uh, and the annualista vestry. Now, minutes are kept. As I said, it's like a company, <coughs> just like a company. So vestry and minutes... And you'll get these, and even going back to St. Catharines for the sake of argument, I know to my cost, looking in for a particular, at a particular case, looking through the vestry minutes, and it has all of the people who were at the, minute, at the meeting would have signed their names at the bottom. Okay? So it's interminable looking through these things. And I think actually they held vestry, meet, vestry minutes in that parish about every week. So you can imagine what I've been uh, <coughs> trying to look through for about 30 years. Um, List of vestrymen, if you can get them, uh, not all the registers are, are always there. It'll show who was a parishioner in the parish. 
that can be very, very useful. And I'll come on to that again when I come to St. Catharines. The annual reports and accounts, they tend to be more modern things, but they will show who paid sustentation, which is basically like um, you're, you're paying a maintenance cost for the church. So you pay the sustentation, uh, will for, cover the graveyard and to a large extent, but also for the church as well and the expenses of the rector. And Sunday school records obviously show who attended. The great thing about the Church of Ireland records is that they, most parishes also have burial records. Um, and some burial registers contain uh, records of all burials that took place in the graveyard. You know, whether they were from that church or from, let's say, a local Catholic church, which might not have had a graveyard at the time, but might have a graveyard. Some only contain Church of Ireland. Uh, but that's just one of these things. If necessary, obviously, you investigate the gravestones. Don't use shaving foam. Please, just use water or a mirror and the sun. It's great. And baptisms of Methodists and Presbyterians, certainly early, early ones, tend to be in Church of Ireland registers. And there's no register registration of bands pre-1845. But you often find those afterwards. So the registers in the RCB libraries, those of you who've been in there know that you have the actual registers there. Paper is lovely and thick. You don't have to wear, it's not like who do you think you are, you, know, you have to put on your white gloves and go in. I think, I think the argument that they make is you, you actually get a better feeling for, especially if you're turning pages looking for something, um, you get a better feel for the, uh, the registers themselves. But obviously that means that the registers sometimes are in a hell of a state. Uh, as I say, some are in delicate condition. Some are faded, and a lot of the fading sometimes is done by, with water damage. So, I mean, there have been innumerable parishes and inner city Dublin parishes, country parishes where I've been looking through, I said there's no point in even trying to decipher anything down the bottom of that page. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's illegible. Um, as I say, as I said earlier on, they were originally loose, loose leaf and then they were sent to a bookbinder. Um, some of them were sent to a bookbinder. Some of them, I think, were probably more in the lines of <coughs> standard things sent out by the church uh, to, to use. Um, the later registers, the earlier registers tended to be uh, a one-liner. The later ones tended to be in boxes. But uh, sometimes not all of those boxes were used. Um, in, I mentioned here that you can include the addresses of the people who died, the occupations, and the parish of the spouse. So for, for the sake of argument, in a marriage, a marriage will quite often be, there'll be two marriages to a page, uh, and the registers will be like that, and there'll be maybe two or three marriages to the page, and it would have which parishes the people were actually from. Okay, quite, quite a lot of information there. Um, for deaths, um, Sometimes the registers would only include the date and the name. Sometimes it would include the date, the name, and the age, and sometimes also the occupation and the address. So sometimes you can get a full understanding. Uh, and a lot of the Dublin ones, uh, like I think St. Catherine, St. James, uh, you're looking down and you can see. Sometimes they change when the rector changes. Sometimes maybe they no longer put down the age, or sometimes the reason for death is included. Uh, and um, it, so there can be quite a lot of information there. So where, whereas you might be missing a lot of that in Catholic parishes, sometimes it might be worthwhile just looking in the Church of Ireland parish for the, for the same for the same area, just in case the person was buried there, and it might give you the reason for the death possibility. Um, some of the earlier registers <coughs> were combined registers. Often they were combined births, marriages and deaths. Sometimes they were combined with the vestry minutes, which can be quite confusing, because you suddenly come on to, in the middle of all the vestry minutes, you suddenly come on to three pages of births. 
but there were combined registers, and some of those so some of those registers actually um, cover the same period as um, a register of baptisms. I've actually, in in many cases, you know, you start with a combined register, and they all start let's say in eight, 1675, but the births only go on to 1699. Uh, the marriages go on to 1720, and then the deaths go on to 1705, and then the next one starts. So you're starting off on different lines. And then you also find that someone started up a, a, a baptism register in uh, 1720 or something as well. So it can be quite confusing. And I've actually seen in one case that I was looking at relatively recently, uh, they, they were written into a combined register, and I was actually I looked through the combined register, and then I was looking through a separate reg uh, register of, I think, baptisms, and suddenly came across a whole batch of names that I'd already seen. So they were written in twice. It was a bit ridiculous. Huh? <laughs> some people have nothing to do. Um, uh, as I say, some of the some of the earlier registers hold minimal minimal information, <clears throat> but it depends. I think once the boxes came in, uh, and they're quite good because I mean, obviously. Working with Catholic records, sometimes you're 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 looking. I mean, I'm Scottish, and it looks as if they were trying to put in as many things in a page as they could. And in the early Church of Ireland ones, exactly the same. But in the later ones, where you have the boxes, obviously they're not doing that. So St Catherine's. Uh, so here we come on to, and if anyone wants to have a look at this later on, you're quite welcome to do so. We have three. Sorry, I've put on my pants. With three combined registers of births, marriages, and deaths, <clears throat> starting in 1679 um, and going up. Uh, that's 1679 to 1743. Then the second register is 1744 to 1842 for births, marriages uh, 1754 to 1833, and burials 1752 to 1842. Um, there is a small graveyard, it's now a park behind St. Catherine's Church. If any of you, if, if any of you know that particular area, um, there's, a, there's a little uh, graveyard with trees at the back of it. It's quite, quite a nice little graveyard. Um, and it's just, there's no, there's no fence around it or anything like that, as far as I remember. So you have three combined registers which go up to about 1827. And then you have six registers of baptism starting in 1815 going to 1966. So 1815 to 1826 and then on from there. Marriages, how many did I say? 12 marriages. Six, oh yes, sorry, 12. 12, 12 uh, registers of marriages, they didn't tend to hold that much, so don't think that there were loads of people being married. Uh, it's just that the registers don't tend to hold quite as much. And then your registers of burials from 1829 to 1898. Um, we then come on to 12 vestry minute books. We would love, love to keep things going. From 1657 right up to 1969. Okay, so that's the meetings. Should be all of the meetings in there. Uh, and they look as if they cover the whole period. In fact, one double covers. It's great. Um, we have re register of vestrymen between 1941 and 1963. We have the account books from 1824 to 1977. We have preacher's books. Um, a colleague of, of, of Tony's and mine, um, Maeve Mullen, if any of you know Maeve, she's, she's very good on, on um, uh, the Monaghan area. Um, but she did an, she, the church, the RCB library, if you ever go onto their website, they have an archive of the month. Uh, and some of the stuff is very interesting. It's worth just going in and seeing what, what, what they do. Sometimes they do it on particular churches, sometimes on particular records or whatever. They've been doing it for <coughs> a number of years. But um, Maeve did um, uh, um, an, an archive of the month on preacher's books. So preacher's books are when uh, every Sunday for the sake of argument, you come in, you put the date. Was it a particular particular Sunday, was it Trinity Sunday or uh, Kingship Sunday or whatever it was, how many uh, people you had at the service, how many communicants you had, how much money you collected, 
See, we're back to money again. That's why I like Church of Ireland. It's Scottish, you know, I like money. Um, so you have, you have uh, the amount of money collected, and then you have a, a section there for comments, and it might be baptism of something, or there might be all sorts of different things. And Maeve did an, ar a, a, an archive of the month on that. It, 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 was, it was very good to, to read. So the preacher's books go from 1803 to 1961. You have two confirmation registers from 1910 to 1935 and then 1951 to 1969. And you have a volume of copy deeds from 1296 to 1880 and related parish history. Okay, so you're going right back. The, um, St. Catherine's, as far as I remember, was in... Um, what was it? It was in... It was in a special thing, uh, what's it, uh, I don't know, I forget what it was. Anyway, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a special area, and I think it was basically to a large extent the Earls of Me, the Babasons, uh, had held, held it over them. Um, you then have school records, which count school account books from 1824, governor's minute books, indentures, in other words, that, was be, that would be people who then got an indenture to work with a grave digger for the sake of argument or with a carpenter or whatever. Uh, uh, Rainbow Bazaar and Fate account book, 1908. I couldn't bother looking at that one. I'd love to look at it. Rough, uh, board rough minute books. Honours, records of honours for girls and for boys. School board and Protestant Orphan Society. You then go on to Sunday school record books. And then organizations, or organizations and societies. Uh, some of the Band of Hope, uh, Christian Minute Book, uh, Guild of Youth Minute Book, um, Register of Bands, Parish Magazines, Miscellaneous youth Loose Papers, that is a very interesting one there. And then some mis miscellaneous volumes, Widows Alms House Minute Books. I'll skip the next one for a minute. Officers of Health and Ass Assisting Committee Minute Book, brilliant, Vestry Assessments, uh, Letter book disbursement to parish cess. Um, and the list of parishioners. Now, this was one that actually really interested me because I was a particular case I was looking at. I was looking for a particular name and a particular address. And the list of parishioners covers 1814, 1855 to 58, and 1897. And I was looking in, I think it was, 18, uh, it was 1814. I was looking for a particular family, and it went basically up each street um, and it said who the, who the parishioners were. Now I think when it says parishioners, I think it probably covered everyone who was within the parish boundary, irrespective of what religion they were. Okay. But it had the names there of presumably the person who was the main occupier of the <coughs> building. Not necessarily the owner of the building, but the main occupier. The other thing is the disbursements of the parish cess. The parish cess um, the earlier cess books obviously covered uh, a number of different things, and this is where we come into the tithe department. For some of the things, for the sake of argument, this is going back to St. Anne's, looking at that. For the sake of argument, before the RIC was founded, you would have the watch. So you were paying, you were actually getting money from parishioners for the, for the watch, for the employment of the watch. And this is why I think in some, and it's, it's only it's off the top of my head, in some Church of Ireland parishes, I've noticed, inner city parishes, I've noticed a lot of foundlings. I think probably because of the watch, a lot of those foundlings, be they births or unfortunately children who were found dead. That's why a lot of them probably appear in Church of Ireland records where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be there. They were just found, obviously, uh, in a close or beside the church or something like that. And possibly even people who committed suicide, let's say, drowning themselves in the Liffey, it would be the watcher's responsibility, <coughs> presumably. Uh, but that's probably more off my own head than anything else. So those are the, the types of things there. I've, I've listed them out for St. Catherine's there. The list of parishioners is the one that I highlighted because I think it's really useful. If, you're look, if you happen to be looking. And I've seen one or two other parishes where those exist as well. 
Uh, they don't, they're not there for all the time. <clears throat> I mean, why they were taken at that stage, I don't know. Um, you could effectively say that the tide of the plotments covered them. Uh, and the tide of the plotments um, uh, I had one issue with St. Mary's in Donnybrook, where I was looking for a particular person, <coughs> pardon me, particular name, and the tithe plots were in the Vestry Minute book, big, big book. And um, they covered something like 19, 1832 to 1837 or something. But unfortunately, and I think it must have been bookbinder or whatever, you had a page of 1833 to 1834, another page of 1833 to 1834, <clears throat> page of 1836 to 1837, then a page of 1832 to 1833. They were out of... That's why I actually, before that case, I actually had a full head of hair. Okay? <laughs> I literally tore it out looking at that, trying to track through this particular book. It was, it was an absolute nightmare. <clears throat> So, in the RCB library, there are a small number of records which are digitized. Uh, they're really ones where people have come along and said they're looking themselves for their own family and they've decided with their own <coughs> goodness to go and digitize uh, the records for Delgany for the sake of argument and Monclody will be another one. However, <coughs> the General Synod, the General Synod is, is um, each diocese each, each diocese holds a synod, and then representatives of that synod go into the general synod. The general synod is held in May every year, and the general synod this year, the chairman of the manuscripts committee announced that he had successfully twisted the arm of Heather Humphreys, no longer in charge of heritage, however, he had twisted the arm of Heather, Heather Humphreys, who happened to be in his diocese, although she's not Church of Ireland. Uh, to donate um, money to the Church of Ireland for the digitization of records because it has been the bane of people's lives. Three of us here I know have worked and others of you may have at various times. We worked in, in, in the National Library assisting the permanent staff when over the summer months when it's particularly busy. And you you have people coming in and saying, I'm you know, I'm from America, I'm here for a couple of weeks and I'm going off to Galway now tomorrow, and I'm checking, you say Church of Ireland? Yes, Church of Ireland. And you say, right, okay, well, the Church of Ireland records aren't in the middle of Dublin. Uh, I was in Churchtown, and so they're going to have to go to Churchtown, make sure that they're, the RCB library closes at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Those of you who've been there, yes, yeah, you're sent down to the, to the local pub. Um, so you have to be out between one and two, and then it closes at, I think, half five. I normally go there in the morning, so it's, um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's quite inconvenient. So to actually get the work, to actually get it digitised, and, and I had a word with Susan Hood at the General Synod and said, Susan, that's actually fantastic. What do you actually want to do? About it? And she said, well, what they were thinking of, and this is, this is not confirmed yet, was I think they were thinking of getting uh, a machine, putting it in the the boardroom or research room down below isn't used that much. Getting interns in there and digitizing, scanning the stuff and then digitizing it. Um, I mentioned earlier on about Prony not being happy to uh, put the records on the website that the um, RCB will be putting theirs on. That's because it's irishgenealogy.ie. Okay. Um, and the if there is ever, again, uh, a government instalment, it is very doubtful, ever, that they would consider putting anything on an EU website, apart from it, an EU country's website. Um, but the reason why the, I think the, I, I, the RCB Library, I'm sure, have had loads of offers from people, <coughs> like <coughs> Find My Past and Ancestry, to, to digi digitise. But they have always looked on it that these records had to be free. So just as with the Catholic parish records, putting them on to the National Library website, <coughs> the Church of Ar the, the RCP Library don't think they'd consider putting it on their own website, but they might do. Uh, or the, the 
uh, Anglican website. They will probably put it onto Irish Genealogy, I would say, but it'll be a free website. How it will be structured, I don't know. Whether it will be like the Catholic Parish Register, so it's done in, in parish order and then date order, or whether it's searchable by name, which is what you would like, then um, I don't know. And I don't, they're, they're not, for, Susan certainly wasn't forthcoming about what they'd be doing. To the best of my knowledge, they haven't started the work yet. They hadn't three weeks ago. Um, so uh, what, uh, I know that when we were working in the National Library, we were told all about this in the, in the June that it was launched, uh, with the Catholic Parish Registers. Um, but we knew that it was, it was always told to us, look, it could be picked up by one of the others, and it was picked up by Ancestry and Find My Pass within about six or seven months and put onto their website so that they could, you could search by name. Um, so the format, as I say, is unclear at the moment. So, as I say, use the links um, on the uh, Church of Ireland Registers website, the PDF, go to the card index in the black books. Um, and I mentioned the other documents. <coughs> we, were, we were updating the um, a history of the parish uh, about 10 years ago and I went in and I said is there anything else in here and they said oh yeah there's a box here and there's a manila kind of box okay hard box and then it was the deed of consecration of the church in 1834 now when I started it was folded over and I started unfolding it it started breaking so I left it okay but there was a whole sheaf of letters from various rectors into the diocesan office. No replies, unfortunately. That would be lovely to see. But uh, all these letters were there, uh, as they had been written 100, 150 years ago. So it's always worthwhile checking to see what newspapers there are. Records held in the parish. There is a constitutional right of, of access because our public record. Sorry, one thing, one thing I forgot to mention. Um, if you have any of you actually asked the RCB library for a photocopy of anything? Yeah. Yes. You yeah. have? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. You can tell from that that it's not big. A is costly. B, you're not allowed to take uh, you know, you're not to get out, allowed to get out your phone and take take a copy. If you want a copy from, from a register, and I, I did recently for someone, um, the person died in 1825. And it gave, the register gave, the, a bit faint, the date, the name, and the address. So I knew it was the right person. And I said, can I have a photocopy? So what I got was a photocopy of the line, date, name, person. Now that could have been from anything. And the person would have been very unhappy if I just sent it to him. So I said, can I have the copy of the full page? And one of the things, by the way, when, when you're sending it off as part of, let's say, a report, has to be copyright of the National Archive. This is because it was pre-1869, uh, 1870, 71. Um, so it's Public Records Office. Um, they will, what they will do is they will give you the page, and it will say, 1825 up the top, burials, black, date, name, dress, black. That's what you'll get. <laughs> so how it's going to be dealt with when it is digitized, I do not know. I don't actually want to know. <laughs> so, sorry, so when you, when you have you have constitutional right of access, you can write to the rector twice, and you can ring the rector. Um, and if they, they're not particularly happy, if they have the registers there, and they're not particularly happy, you can say, well, lodge them in the RCB library temporarily. Okay. Memorials, gravestones, uh, obviously to look at. Memorials in churches. Uh, I was actually looking at something recently about, about uh, uh, deaths of people in World Wars I and II in, in, um, in County Wicklow. There's a book by, by the Burnells. Uh, and they had a picture of a couple of the, the memorials within the churches. And there are other memorials for notable families there. One other thing, for people who are in, you may remember this from last time, this is a book called The List of Successions. Okay? If any of you want to break your foot, I'm happy to stand with it and then take my hand away. Okay? It is rather heavy, but it has a record here of all the churches in Dublin and separately in Glenlock, with all the rectors and curates and perpetual uh, 
perpetual um, uh, priests that I had there, and they're all listed in there. And what's happened to the church, whether it combined with another church, whether it closed, deconsecrated, whatever. And then, later on, is a biography of each of those people. Some of them may have served in more than one diocese, so it's worth looking. But they, it gives a lot of information, such as <coughs> where, when they were born, who the parents were, who they married, maybe some of their children, especially if they, if they, 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 uh, they became rectors in the Church of Ireland. And the, the typewritten records from, they were actually all done by uh, a fellow called uh, Cameron Bl Blennahasset, uh, or J, uh, J. Blennahasset Leslie, sorry, J.B. Leslie. Uh, apart from Cork, Klein and Ross, which were done by Masio Brady, and they're being updated now shortly. Um, so these are being kept up to date, if anyone is going to be updating that one as well. Um, briefly, I want to mention Huguenot records. Um, for those of you with a, a great knowledge of history, that was the Protestant church in, in France. Um, and after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, they ended up leaving, <coughs> having to leave or flee France. Some of them went to uh, Holland, a lot of them went to the UK, and a number of them came to Ireland. So that's why you have some, some of the more exotic French type names like De La Touche, etc. And there were main clusters, uh, Port Arlington. This is why you have in Port Arlington, you had a French church and an English church. The French church was a Huguenot church, English church was the Anglican church. There were both Anglican churches, but one presumably spoke in French, the other in English. Um, if you have particular things, there's a the Huguenot website, um, and they have records in the National Library. Raymond Ray Fosse, who was in charge of the RCB Library, kept the records for that. I think he's probably still the contact person for that, for the, for the Huguenot Society. He's a great, great store of knowledge about stuff like that. Now, I understand from uh, Tony that you had a talk on the couple of beggars, uh, the last, so I'm not going to go over that again. <coughs> Only to say, pardon me, um, one of the ones that interested me was not so much the couple of beggars, but Reverend Schultz, who was pastor of the Lutheran Church, which was, I think, in Poole Bank Street. And uh, there was, uh, they're forgotten about quite often these particular records. Uh, a lot of them, I think, were probably used, and about to Jim Reese's knowledge on this, were for, for Schultz, um, for the Lutheran ones, were the, um, for Protestants marrying Catholics, not Catholics not wanting to go through the interminable thing of having to join the Church of Ireland and probably renounce absolutely everything that they've ever done. Um, uh, but the Protestants not wanting to lose their birthright. So they were marrying within a Protestant church. Unfortunately, the records normally just contain uh, surnames, forenames, maybe maybe regiment or, uh, or regiment possibly, uh, and date. And that's it. There's nothing else. A particular case I was looking at a number of years ago when, when these first came out was for a friend of mine, his, an ancestor of his had married a Catholic, he was fairly certain of that. And I found her in St. Aldwin's, uh, the Polish church there, uh, Core Market. And um, actually, a colleague of ours from, from, from UCD had, had sent an email. I checked him there. There it was on Christmas Day. Which to, to me, it was a strange day for getting married in a church. Um, but Reverend Schultz obviously did it probably in the kitchen. And I think witness was quite often just a sermon. Um, and they're held, as you probably know, in, in, the, in the GRO as opposed to the PRO because of a court case. Someone actually tried, tried to, uh, I think it was, it was say that marriage had never taken place and it went to court. And because of that, then it was whipped, whipped up uh, by the GRO before the public record office could get hold of it. And Ros McCutcheon, who was in the UK, had done this for the IGRS. And it's there, it's an available resource, you can go on to it. Uh, and I found that she had one person, two, two ladies from America, two sisters came over. We couldn't find anything in the Catholic registers of the parish 
we couldn't find anything on Irish genealogy um, and we did actually find it and they went up north and, and came back and said a lot of other people didn't know about it so it's worth knowing so um, there's a lot of information in the parishes not just births, marriages and deaths so if you're looking for stuff you may go, go have a look at the the record, if the records exist and they're in the RCB library, <coughs> check on that link on the Church of Ireland Register's PDF and see exactly what they have because there's a lot of stuff there. All right, that's for St. Catharines, um, but there's a lot of stuff there that's very, very useful for anyone who's trying to trace people, uh, not, just the, not just the registers. The, many of the records, as I say, do exist, and, and in some cases, they may be in odd places. Um, sometimes there are books. There are books, I think, on St. Patrick's, and I think possibly on Christchurch as well. So you first find out where the records exist. As I say, use the RCB library as a resource. They have a great deal of knowledge, and they're very helpful if you go in, if, if you happen to go in there, you, you, especially if you can get hold of Susan or possibly Brian. As I say, digitization, people, you know, when people are coming to me and saying, you know, and I'm saying, you know, church town, they're out in church town, and they say, well, okay. I say, well, it's probably going to be about five years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just taking that, because I think digitization of the Catholic records, I think, took something like four years. Um, and these records, they, while they're going to be digitized, they'll still be held in the archive. So presumably, if I went in and said, oh, I want St. St. James's, Sorry, can you wait an hour or whatever? Well, they fin finish digitizing a number of pages and then drop it up and then take it back down again. So I can imagine it could be a bit of confusion. I don't know how logistically they're going to deal with it, but that's up to them, unfortunately, not up to me. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Could I ask? Yes. yes.